Uh, Lanny asked me if I would uh, briefly discuss um, this topic, 100 years of transplant contributions uh, from the University of Chicago. Um, and um, I was delighted to do that. Um, I show you five names that I will touch upon as I uh, go through my list. The first is Alexis Carell, uh, who came uh, born in Lyon, trained in France, spent a year in Montreal, and then came down to Chicago um, for two and a half very productive years, uh, 1904 uh, through late 1906. Um, it was Carell writing in JAMA in 1905 uh, who made the claim that the problem of organ transplantation in man has been solved. Um, he, he, wor he worked at Hull Court. Some of you who know the campus um, know that, that that's where Botany Pond is. Um, indeed, um, as the crow flies from where we are now to where Carell was working, is probably less than a quarter of a mile. Um, his achievements at Chicago, uh, particularly for someone for whom English was a second or third language, were quite extraordinary. Uh, in the two and a half years, he published 33 papers, um, some co-authored. Um, but working in models of dogs and cats and mice and rats, um, some of his achievements during those two and a half years um, were, were to perfect the concept of vascular anastomoses. He did vein to vein grafts, artery to artery grafts, and vein to artery grafts. Um, he, um, he, he did a lot of organ transplantation, um, what he called homo transplants, which were actually in the same animal. He take a kidney out of um, a, a cat or a mouse, and then retransplanted back into the same animal. Um, he, he also did heterotransplants, which were between litter mates, um, and then he did transplants across species. Um, his results, his results, of course, in the homo transplant of, of transplanting back into the same animal were quite extraordinary. Um, across um, litter mates, not nearly as good, um, and of course, total failure in, in transplanting across species. Um, he succeeded in reattaching severed limbs, often again to the same animal from, from which the limb had been severed, and he could preserve organs, um, thyroids and uteruses and kidneys, um, all, all of which he was practicing transplanting um, outside of the animal for four to six hours. Um, uh, for his, um, he, he said, again in the JAMA article, I think this is also in, in 1905, he said, from a clinical standpoint, the transplantation of organs may become important and may open new fields in therapy and biology. Um, for his work at Chicago, uh, he left, when he left Chicago, he, he went to the Rockefeller, where he spent most of his career. But in 1912, he got the Nobel Prize. He was the second surgeon to get the prize. Um, and it was awarded for his work on vascular suture, um, work that he had largely completed at Chicago, and for the transplantation of blood vessels and organs, again, work that he'd largely done uh, while at Chicago. Um, uh, of course, this thing about uh, the transplantation of organs may become important, uh, turned out not to be the case until we had a much better understanding uh, of immunology and, and immunosuppression. Um, uh, but he did establish the, um, the experimental foundation uh, in animals for the human transplants that was started essentially 40 years later by David Hume uh, working at the Brigham uh, under Dr. Francis Moore. Um, Hume graduated from the University of Chicago. Those of you who know our class pictures uh, can find Hume in the class of 43. And when he graduated from the university in 43, he went to the Brigham to work with Dr. Moore, who was not yet working on transplants. Um, uh, this is Dr. Francis Moore, who for 30 years was chair of the Department of Surgery at the Brigham. Um, Hume was a surgical resident. 
And the first successful kidney transplant, uh, successful probably should be in quotes, was in 1947. Um, during his surgical residency at the Brigham, Hume and a fellow resident uh, over the objections, the strong objections of Dr. Moore, who felt that it was premature to do transplants, um, took a 29-year-old postpartum patient who was dying of acute renal failure. Uh, she was about four or five days postpartum. And taking a cadaveric organ from a patient who had just died uh, in the operating theater, uh, implanted it in the forearm uh, of this 29-year-old woman. Um, it, the, the transplant made urine quite immediately, and it was collected in a, in a glass beaker um, that, that simply the ureter was draining into this glass beaker. And four or five days later, the woman recovered her own renal function. The transplant was taken out, and she was sent home. That was in 47. Um, as I say here, uh, this primitive transplant lasted about five days, and the woman's own kidneys were covered. It was thought that she might not have survived uh, had it not been uh, for the temporary uh, use uh, of, of that kidney transplant. Um, Hume conducted for Dr. Moore uh, at the Brigham the first series of kidney transplants, and that was between 1951 and 1953. He did 11 transplants using cadaveric kidneys, um, one of which, nobody understands how or why, but one of which lasted for 175 days. Um, most of them, most of them failed within a month. Um, but he was clearly uh, Dr. Moore's transplant surgeon. Unfortunately, he was called back to the Air Force for the Korean War and um, was in military service at the time that the decision was made by Dr. Moore and his team uh, to try the twin transplant that Laney referred to. And they, they had a, uh, an, another person in the group, Joe Murray, uh, who was called upon, uh, Murray, plastic surgeon, was called upon to um, uh, do the um, actual transplant since Hume was not there. Um, and uh, you heard that that was, in fact, the first successful uh, kidney transplant uh, ever done. Um, Hume is sometimes referred to as the father of renal transplantation. I've t pointed this out to you. I, I skip ahead to Chris Brolsch, whom many of you in the audience know. Um, Chris was here from about 83 to 91, Dick, around there. Uh, about seven or eight years. Um, during that time, um, we worked on, he worked on with his team, um, on reduced liver transplants to fit, fit adult livers into uh, babies and children, on split livers, uh, gi giving the smaller uh, left lobe to children and the larger right lobe to adults, and from that, moving towards doing living donor liver transplants. Um, this paper that we published, uh, Dick Thistlethwaite is on it, and John Lanters is in the audience. Um, uh, Peter Singer was the lead author, and Chris was a senior author. Chris Brosh was published in 1989, three or four months before we did our first transplant here as part of a, a protocol series of 20. Um, uh, the paper had m many interesting aspects to it, one of which it was that it was published before the actual uh, operation w was conducted. Uh, but it offered what has come to be regarded as an ethical model for surgical innovation in transplantation, or for that matter, in innovative surgery. Uh, some even refer to it as the Chicago model. Um, you have to show a proven need for the procedure, uh, approval by institutional leaders, scientific and administrative, strong preclinical and clinical scientific data, uh, acknowledged field strength of the entire team, not, not just the quality of the surgeons, but of the team, the anesthesiologists and the nurses and the infectious disease people and the immunologists and the like. Um, maximal protection of living donors, risk benefits, informed consent. Uh, we 
were among the earliest uh, people to use donor advocates, uh, a, a pro process that we've continued since the late 1980s. We even believed in number six, public disclosure, review, and approval uh, before the first operation. And it was this paper that introduced um, the concept of research ethics consultations, which I won't go into uh, today. But it, it, it was quite an interesting paper um, to write. There had been, at that point, uh, three uh, living donor liver transplants in the world. Uh, Rodney Strong had done a successful one in Australia, and um, uh, two in Brazil had not worked out particularly well. Um, I, I show you um, somewhere in there, I'll bet we could find Dick Thistlethwaite, the surgical team removing uh, left lobe transplant into daughter Alyssa. Alyssa is shown in that uh, front picture with her mom and dad. Uh, Terry, the mom, was the donor. Um, and then we see the little girl down the lower right a year after surgery. Here we see her graduating from high school uh, with her mom, Terry, and a picture of her as a little girl. Since then, she's graduated from college. She's gotten married. And I've heard that she's had a child um, uh, long, long off of immunosuppression. Um, that, that, I, that, that last thing is a little bit unsettled. And, and this was the original paper that came out of that protocol series of 20 kids, uh, liver transplant in children from living related donors. Uh, it was a, a protocol series that was completed rather quickly from December of 89. The paper is, appears in October of 91, um, so that the series probably was done in 18 months. Lainey Ross, who gave the opening lecture and is, is the organizer and moderator of this symposium, um, and is the Carolyn Matthew Buxbaum Professor of Medicine, Surgery, Pediatrics, uh, and of Medical Ethics, and Associate Director of the McLean Ethics Center. Um, Lainey wrote a, a very provocative article as lead author in 1997 um, called Paired Kidney Exchange. This idea had been floating around since who knows when, the 30s or the 50s, um, but had never been implemented. And um, Laney took the lead in, in writing this article uh, suggesting that for people who were not able to donate immediately to a relative, uh, there might be the possibility, well, I'll just show you some of the other people on, on that um, paper, the paired kidney exchange paper, uh, Dr. Thistlethwaite and Michelle Josephson from nephrology, Steve Woodle, uh, who's now at Cincinnati, and David Rubin, who's here. Um, but that there would be this possibility of an exchange, that the first donor who was denied a possibility of giving to recipient one might give to recipient two, in return for which uh, recipient two potential donor would, would donate to recipient one. Th that's the simplest model. Um, and uh, uh, it was one that people began to implement uh, in the wake of um, the publication of Dr. Ross's paper. Um, as the paper said, it analyzed the ethical issues associated with the idea of this paired kidney exchange, uh, a notion uh, that since 1986 uh, had been uh, around but had not been implemented. And it gave rise um, through that simple exchange that I showed you uh, of two, two donors and two recipients um, to this concept of extended altruistic donor uh, chains. Um, this is one particular chain studied by Al Roth in 2014. Uh, Roth, um, got the Nobel Prize uh, for the, um, uh, the residency match program and for his work on, on kidney donation and kidney transplants. Um, so he's particularly interested in, in chains like this. Um, and such chains uh, have been going on now um, in, uh, as a consequence or as, as a benefit of, of Laney's paper. Uh, Laney and Bob Veach recently completed the second edition of this book, Transplantation Ethics, and Laney and Dick Thistlethwaite are currently working on a book, Living Donor Transplantation Ethics. Um, 
Finally, um, I'll come to Mike Millis, and I'll be very brief because I know Mike follows me immediately. Uh, but, but Mike has been working for the better part of 10 years with Jay Fu Wang, the, who for, under three administrations was Vice Minister of Health. He's not currently Vice Minister under this administration. Um, and the Chinese system was under vigorous attack on an ethical basis, uh, particularly for its use of um, executed prisoners uh, as, as donors. And um, J. Fu Wang wrote this very brave paper um, in the Western literature in 2007, in which he acknowledged um, for the first time in print that, that uh, many, not the majority, of Chinese transplants were, were getting their organs from uh, ex executing prisoners. And of course, that opened up the door to possibility of transplant tourism and the like. You, you, you could schedule your transplant for enough money. Um, uh, the clinical outcomes that were being sought in this relationship between Chicago and tri China were to improve the training of transplant surgeons, to decrease the number of transplant programs, I'm sure Mike will talk about this, to see if they could establish a national registry and even develop a national system of organ sharing. The hope for ethical outcomes from this Chicago-China partnership was to stop the use of executed prisoners as donors. Uh, I'll let Mike talk further about that. To establish brain death as a standard, um, rather than just cardiac death, uh, to increase the use of deceased donors, to uh, encourage the use of living donors, and at the same time, to prohibit the buying and selling of organs and transplant tourism. Um, J. Fu Wang and Mike wrote this paper, it's 2015, on voluntary organ donation systems adapted to Chinese cultural values and social reality. So uh, I think Chicago has um, played an important role uh, over the past 100 years in advancing uh, the field of transplantation uh, from, from basic or animal models uh, to human models, uh, now even in the international stage. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. I'll be happy to take a question or two, then turn it over to Mike. Thanks. If there are no questions, Lainey?